Remembrance of Crown Heights. Hatred roamed the streets last night. Rumblings of Schwarzer and Dirty Jew. Enough already, I say. Will this malice between men never cease? Would that I could forge a solid chain of brotherhood with just a golden word and a tear for the fallen. Love overcomes prejudice, I repeat in my Hebrew prayers. And even the departed spirits seem to sigh, come together over us. My last mantra, I have sought thee, Lord, halfway across the globe. I have prayed in backward tongues to reach you. I have stood on mountaintops to glimpse you. I mistakenly <coughs> took the voice of a young child as yours. I have looked under rocks for you. I have searched beneath the sea for you. But Lord, if I had not found you yet, perhaps you, in your grace, will soon find me. Which I've never spoken to, spoken about in the last seven years. So, Baruch Hashem, we have our Nava. We have a Terrace Nava, which is a seminary, and Benochai, which is a high school. All three very different entities. Um, Ornava, as you know, does not charge any money. Um, it's been free for the last seven years. We don't want to charge money. We tried a membership, and um, for $75, you were getting back a lot more discounts, going to stores. It didn't work. Um, I think we sold 50 memberships. We have 3,500 women on the Ornava mailing list. So out of the 3,500 women, we got 50. I'm a, I'm a very big guy in Hakar Satov, and um, I think it's very important outside of Ornava that people need to have Hakar Satov. So financially, um, we don't bother anybody for money in Ornava, but Ornava today does a lot of things that people who are watching and listening and even people who are sitting in this room have absolutely no idea about. And it's just stuff that we have to do because we, we're dealing with anything that a woman, that any Abbas Yisrael has to deal with in her life, whether it's medically, mentally, physically, spiritually, monetarily, whatever it is, it comes to our table, whether it's from Eretz Yisrael or England or, or Canada or any state in the United States, it comes to our table. And it's extremely expensive. The reason that Rabbi Wallerstein has been gone for three weeks, and my boys are in worse shape than you because I actually flew back this morning, um, I was in California because Avivit said, if you miss tonight's share, you're in big trouble. So, um, so my boys last night missed the share. So actually the boys' share um, I missed for four weeks. In my whole life, since I started being a Rebbe, I never missed four weeks of share. The reason that I've been gone has been to raise money to pay the bills of Arnava. Um, and that has taken away a lot of um, the time that I need to spend with helping girls and giving shirim and, and preparing shirim. So, you don't get paid. Uh, they know I don't get paid. Trust me. If I got paid, I'd show up on time. <laughs> <laughs> no, Baruch, Baruch Hashem, I am, I'm in the plastic bag business, and I've been in that business since, I'm, since I started in Chinuch, and I work half a day. Hashem has been very kind to me and my family that I've never needed to take one dollar from Ornava, Teres Nava, Ben Ochayr, teaching or anything that I've ever done in Chinuch. And not only that, I will not allow my children, in-laws, son-in-laws, or daughters to work in anything that I do as far as Ornava, Teres Nava, Ben Ochayr, that nobody should say he created these things to get his kids jobs or his wife a job. So Baruch Hashem, Hashem should continue um, to be able to give me a parnasa that I have absolutely never taken a penny from anything that I've done, neither has my family. In fact, if I told you the numbers that we put into this organization, you would probably fall off your chairs. 
So we're at no, I will not tell them. Now we're we're at a point where where I'm a little tired. I've been flying around the world, and uh, I actually didn't raise that much money. And we're at a point where it's at a critical situation where we have to pay bills and rent and people that work for me, and we're not able to. So there are 30,000 hits a month on my share on Torah Anytime, which means there are 30,000 people that watch my share every month. If every person watching this year would give one dollar, that will definitely not change their life. We we'll just give one dollar, that's three hundred and sixty thousand dollars a year. That's at one dollar for every person who watches this year. If you give five dollars, it's in the millions. Five dollars times three thirty thousand is one hundred fifty thousand dollars a month, which would cover everything. So we're asking everyone who's, who watches and who gets Hana from the Shiurim, we're not asking you for $1,000, we're not asking you for $100. We're asking for $5 a week. And that would take the pressure off me, which would give me the time to give you more time and more Shiurim and hire more people and do more projects. Um, the whole world, there's... Or now in Muncie, there's or now they want to open in Chicago, they want to open everywhere. And it's it's Mamish a dream. It's a Sarah Schneerer movement. It's a movement that women all over the world, in fact of Chaim Kainevsky told me to stay in Eretz Yisrael, um, because it's so so much needed. And I said I hope the Rav's not paskining it because Avi will not be happy. Um, <laughs> so so Baruch Hashem he said I'm not paskining it. So it, it, it's, it's huge, and you're all very much part of it from the beginning. And um, every woman in the world wants to have an Arnava. So to create that and to make that happen takes a lot of energy, a lot of people working, and it takes a lot of money. And I, I think we have the craziest shot to the <coughs> That I can tell you. I can tell you that, that Coca-Cola is a name when it comes to drinking soda. Arnava is a name that when it comes to Jewish women, wherever... I go. Doesn't matter if I'm in England, in London, in Manchester. I was in Israel, Florida. I was at a restaurant. You're Rabbi Walsing from Ornava, right? You're the you're the rabbi from Ornava. Everybody, Ornava is the name when it comes to women, and um, it's just starting. It's mamish just starting. So we're not looking to break anyone's bank. We're not looking to to be crutches. It's 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 five dollars a week. Five dollars a week turns into over a million dollars and that's our budget and uh, then we can do the things that we need to do I've never done this I've never asked you but honestly I'm tired it was a lot of flying and a lot of schlepping and a lot of begging and I didn't come back with it anyway so this is much easier so if we can do that um, especially all the people that are watching um, Torah anytime doesn't charge money to watch my share all you need to do is to go to Ornava, O-H-R-N-A-A-V-A dot com and just, is, is, is there a Tzedakah box there or something? Donate now. Donate now. Five bucks. It won't, it won't change your life, but it will change ours. And it will change Klai Yisrael's life. All right, enough of that. Okay, I don't like doing that. I did it. I'm Yaitza because my staff is like, Wallstein, we need you. So you got to stop running around the world. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for and, and, I, and I have to tell you that... Very boring sitting in a plane. I have no one to talk to. So, like, you know, I'm looking for the little blue light. Nothing. Garnished. So, yeah. Pringles. Three o'clock last night. I'm on a plane three o'clock last night. Interesting plane. It's called Virgin America. Never went on this plane to California. But they had 11.40 left California last night, which is 2.40 New York time. So I get on this plane. I sit down. And um, they have a screen. And, of course, I'm starving. I'm like, no. I'm on my diet, you know, me and my diet, I'm going to sleep. So I try to go to sleep. The guy on my left is snoring. The guy behind me is laughing like a hyena in the middle of the night. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know what's going on, what these guys were drinking, whatever it was. And um, so I try to fall asleep. I think I fell asleep for two hours. So it must have been like 4.30, quarter to five New York time in the morning. I wake up and um, I'm very hungry. But I'm like, I'm on a diet. Well, let me see what they have. So they have a screen. 
that you order the food, like a waitress, you order the food on the screen, everybody has a screen, and you push snack, I push snack. Of course, all those chocolate things came up, but Baruch Hashem, they're all and I'm done with that, so it wasn't a problem. And there's this big sign, Pringles. <laughs> a big one, not the little Pringles, but the big Pringles. And I'm like, Pringles at 4.30 in the morning? But I'm very hungry. And I just gave a shear on Eil HaMashpatim and what it means to be free and what it means to be an Eved. And I'm like, I'm going back to sleep. I'm not having those Pringles. And I'm going to go there tomorrow. I'm going to tell all those girls, no matter how hungry you are, no matter what it is, if you're strong enough, you can fight it. So I went back to sleep. And I woke up five minutes later and I ordered the Pringles. <laughs> It was the most amazing box of Pringles I've ever had in my whole life. <laughs> Every single one of them, I ate slowly. <laughs> and the guy who was snoring next to me wakes up and says, could you crunch a little quieter? <laughs> you heard me crunching. I lost my battle. What should I tell you? All right, you have to know that I'm human. So anyway, that's what's this week's Pasha. That's going to lead me right in to this week's Pasha. Because Rashi talks about Pringles. No. Because the Pasha talks the following. Listen carefully. If you're going to buy an Evid Ivri. Now what's an Evid Ivri? An Evid Ivri. So we're just learning the Gemara. It's interesting how Shem works it out. That the Dafyaimi and the Pasha many times crisscross. So it's talking about how an Evid Ivri um, becomes an Evid Ivri. And, and the Gemara says that an Evid Ivri means that, he, that the Bezdin sold him for money. So, or he sold himself for money. So how does a person get so poor that you have to sell yourself as a slave as a Jew? So the Gemara talks about that. It was a Shemitah, and he, you, he, you're not supposed to sell Shemitah products. He sold Shemitah products on, on, on Yantif and on Shemitah, and then because of that, he lost, his, he lost his field, and then he lost his money, and then he lost everything, and then he went and he stole, and then he got caught. And then they said, pay back what you stole. He says, I can't. They said, well, then we have to sell you. So the most you're allowed to sell them is for six years. And during those six years, it's very interesting that if the owner has one pillow, the pillow goes to the slave. That's how we treat a Jewish slave. If you have one pillow, it goes to the slave. One fork, it goes to the... Whatever the best you have in your house, it goes to the slave. Because at the end of the day, he was a very poor man that had to sell himself for money. So if you buy an Eved Ivri, Shei Shadim Tavayit, he should work for you for six years, Uva Shvi Yetzi Lechavshi, on the seventh year he goes free. In Begapo Yavo, if he came into the marriage alone, Begapo Yetzi, he goes out alone. In Baal Ishehu, but if he was married, and this whole situation happened, and he sold himself as a slave, right? V'yatze Ishta Imo, so his wife, when he leaves, his wife goes out with him. What happened if while he was there, this master had a shifcha knanis, a maidservant that wasn't Jewish? The master has a right to have this Jewish slave marry this shifcha, or be with this shifcha. If he gives it as a wife to this man, and he has children, or daughters. She does not go out free. And the children do not go out free. So he buys an Eved, right? The Eved works, he pays him. And then after the Eved leaves, the woman that he married while he was a servant by the master stays. Plus all the children stay. So he has to leave this new wife and those kids behind. And he leaves alone. If the servant says, I don't want to leave. I know I can leave. I don't want to leave. I want to stay. I love my master. As Ishti, my wife, my new wife, my Shifcha Knanis. As Banai, my children that I had here. I don't want to go out. I want to stay here. The master takes him to Bezdin, 
they bring him to the door, to the mezuzah, they make a hole through his ear with an anvil, and he's a servant forever, which means till Yovel, till the 50th year. It could be he was sold 10 years before Yovel, it could be he was sold 20 years before Yovel. The minute Yovel comes, he could say, I want to be with my wife and I want to be with my children, he's out of there. He's sent out for free. So, there's a lot of Gemara and there's a lot of Rashi and there's a lot of Chazal on this. There's also a lot of Kabbalah on this. I'm going to choose Kabbalah. Okay? No one's going to come serve it, but I'm going to push the button Kabbalah. Now, a little bit drush on this. It's talking about a person in this world. Bigapo Yavo. A person comes into this world alone. Very alone. If you ever watch the baby be born, it's very nice. It's surrounded by people. It's mother, it's father, nurse, doctor, right? But it's, it comes out itself, and it's an interesting. There's a, there's a moment when the baby's very alone. They take the baby, right? Because the doctor's busy with the mother. They take the baby and they put it in a warmer. And they wrap it. Well, first they don't wrap it, actually. They, leave, they let it lay there in, on the warmer just so it should warm it up. And when the baby's laying there in the warmer, it's left alone for a couple of seconds. And then the nurse comes and they do whatever they have to do. They wrap them up. They, they give them a little needle, a little bandage, a little stuff in their eyes, whatever it is. And when a person leaves this world, you also leave alone. So the truth is, what do you really have? You come in alone, this is what the Pasuk is telling us. You come in alone, you can have a million friends on Facebook, off Facebook, real friends, not real friends, whatever you want, right? You could have a lot of money. You could have cars. You could have a master's, a bachelor's, a PhD. People could call you doctor. You could have $20 million in your account. At the end of the day, you leave with nothing. You could have designer clothes, but they don't bury you in designer <laughs> clothes. It's just a white robe without pockets. That's it. Everyone leaves the same way. And everybody comes in the same way. Always have that in front of you. Always have in front of you that at the end of the day I am going to leave with nothing. So all these things that are getting in my way are not that important. That she parked blocking my driveway a little bit. That their house they built a little bit on my property. All this stuff that bothers people. Every, it's an interesting thing. My, it was my father's yard site, which I'd like to tell a little story. I felt a little bad that I wasn't here for his yard site. His yard site was Friday, this past Friday. I came back from Eretz Yisrael this past Friday. Got back here for Shabbos. Got a phone call Sunday. Went back to L.A. So his yard site, I like to be, I like to talk about him, you know, on his yard site. I spoke in Eretz Yisrael a lot. Um, so, when I go to Eretz Yisrael, Eretz Yisrael, I always go, it's a big Indian to go to your father's or mother's, if they're not in this world, or to graves to daven on Eretz Yisrael. It's a special tefila to say Eretz Yisrael. So my father's buried in Petach Tikva, in a, in a place called Skula. On the way out of the, of the cemetery, so they have a huge piece of land that's already prepared for people who are going to die, you know, so they have this concrete and they have these little boxes and so they're it's like a huge piece of land and then it's cut off into like, because what does the person have at the end? It's four feet, it's nothing. Um, so I always get out of the car, I do this always every Yom Kippur, and it's, it's, I don't even know how to explain you the square, I mean it's a little bit morbid, but the whole square is this, no not even that wide, this to about here. It's, it's not even that wide. It's more narrow because in Eretz Yisrael they dig and then they they put the they put the stretcher in. It's not a coffin. They put the stretcher in sideways. It's mamish nothing. It's it's you know what? It's a little wider than my stender. It's a little wider than my stender, and it's about this big. 
I get out of the car, and I stand right in the middle. There's no, there's no bodies there. It's, it's like a field, but it's set up already to be a basic for us. I stand in the middle. I'm like, Zechariah Wallstein, you need to know that at the end, this is it. What you're standing on, this is all you're getting. That's it. Not a big backyard, not an acre. This is it. You could have 12 bathrooms in your house with chandeliers and carpet and money and Maseratis <laughs> and clothing. And most. This is it. Look at what you're going to end up in. Even though it costs $20,000, that little piece of dirt, <laughs> right? But this is where you're going to end up in. And it's, I do it always on Erev Yom Kippur so that I should go through Yom Kippur and I should understand... What are you getting angry at other people? You took this. You took that. I wanted this. I was here first. What? In the end, what? What are you fighting about? Another piece of chocolate? What? They figured out that a person eats in their life. Someone told me. I didn't, I didn't Google it or whatever. I don't know how to Google but whatever. Even if I knew how. A person eats in their life. I don't know. It's like a... It's like a crazy amount, like a hundred or five hundred thousand tons of food from when you're born till you die if you live like till 90 years old. Like 500,000 tons of food one person eats. You eat, you eat, you know, if you add it all up. At the end, <laughs> if you weren't sick and whatever, everything went great, whatever it is, you weigh 180 pounds, let's say. A guy, 180 pounds. So you invested... You invested hundreds of thousands of tons of food to get where? To 180 pounds. So what's going to happen with the 180 pounds? The maggots are going to eat it. So you're so busy your whole life with food. I should talk, right? Chocolate. So at least the maggots will have a sweet tooth, you know? Hey, it's Wallerstein, you know? <laughs> you got chocolate. Bittersweet. Parv. Right? Your whole life, you're so busy. Food, food, this kind of food, that kind of food, fancy food, right? Fancy restaurants, all this. It's nothing. It doesn't go, it's not there. At the end of life, the steak ain't there. It's not there. The restaurant's not there. It's all not there. The Prada shoes, not there. The shoes with the red bottoms, what are those called? What are those called? The red bottoms are like $700 a pair? You're not supposed to know the answer to this question. <laughs> just testing, just testing. What is the right? I don't know the answer, but I know it's very expensive. I know that it's so expensive that they have women now that buy red paint, and they paint the bottom of their shoes. <laughs> I'm serious. They go to Payless, they buy a pair of shoes, and then they pay the bottom rent. <laughs> right? So $700 pair of shoes, $900 pair of shoes, $500 pair of shoes, all these shoes all the Prada, all the Gucci, all the stuff, all the fashion world selling you, all this stuff. At the end, a white linen robe without pockets. You, don't, you can't decide fashion white on white, gold with white, what this has to match. Garnished. All that clothing, tons and tons of clothing. <coughs> Nothing. All that money. All that money that you're going to leave over, your kids are going to party. You're going to party. You're going to lose it right away because that money was given to you. There's no Gosh Baruch will give it to the person. What's going to happen with their children? So, so the Mishpatim is telling us, what I'm about to tell you, it has to always be in front of your eyes so that you understand what is important in life. So he says, in Begapa Yavai, Begapa Yetzay. If you're going to come in alone, you're going to go out alone, then you did nothing. It's a waste of time because all that other stuff in between, you're not going to go out with anyway. But says the Pasuk. In Bal Isha, who? Bal Isha, Isha is compared to the Torah. In Bal Isha. But if you're a Baal Isha. You're the Baal. You're the owner. You're the boss. The Baal is the boss. The Isha of the Torah. You're doing mitzvahs and you're helping people. And you're doing chasadim. She will go out with you. You will not go out alone. You'll go out with your Ishta. You'll go out with, with your mitzvahs and your, 
and your, and, your, and your Torah and all the good deeds that you did, that nobody could take away from you. And as I explained, I don't know if I explained it in Ornava, but as I explained the whole thing of a soul, right, of what is a soul, that a soul is a person's emotions, right, a person's personality, which is something you cannot see, you cannot measure, right, because it's, it's not a 3D, it's nothing that's in 3D. So that, now I'm getting a little deep here, okay, but it's called the lavush of the soul. The soul also gets dressed. You don't want your soul coming to the next world not dressed. That's very embarrassing. So, in all the Kab Kabbalistic form, it talks about when people saw in the other world, they saw somebody in the other world that says he was wearing beautiful gold robes, a beautiful robe. The Gemara talks about a, a vision that someone saw. They were dressed in these beautiful robes and these robes of Amuna. <laughs> And there's robes of chesed, and there's different robes. Of, there's different robes that a person can wear. So the person's lavush, the person's clothing, in the next world, is his mice and tovim in this world. Is what he does good in this world. The person's ATM card, the person's ATM card in the next world, is his Torah and his mitzvahs. The physical world has to stay here. It's it's a fact of creation. There are two separate worlds that we live in when we're here. We live in an emotional world and we live in a physical world. The physical world, the physical part of you, of each person in this room, has to stay in the physical world. That's where it comes from. That's where it goes. It has to stay in this world. The spiritual and the emotional and the personality of the person has to go to the other world because that's its source. Everything goes back, it's a scientific fact, everything goes back to its source. So now, if you know, if you know that the physical, everything that you're doing in this world, physical, cannot go with you on the big trip. It's going to have to stay here. The valises with all the clothing and all the food and all the everything is going to have to stay here. It can't go with you. So then, why are you packing 6,000 suitcases? It's not going with you. Why are we so busy in the materialistic world? It says the Pasuk that you have to know that in Baal Isha, but if you do mitzvos, you do chesed, and you help people. So now, one second. What, is it, what does it mean to do a mitzvah? What's the, what's the mitzvah? So you do a misa, let's say you help somebody, right? But at the same time, that person's happy, there's an emotional giving. The, 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 the misa is a representation, when you put on tefillin, it's a representation, right? The, the misa brings to the machshav. So, whatever a person does in this world that's a mitzvah, even though the, the physical, and that's, that's why when Mashiach comes, we put the two together. Because otherwise, just create a world of souls. But because the physical and spiritual world work together, so when Mashiach comes, HaKadosh Baruch is going to put them back together. So when you put on tefillin, you're taking the physical world and you're making it spiritual. If you, if you, if you take an apple and you don't make a bracha, then that apple will never come to the next world. If you make a bracha, then that apple, you're taking that apple because you made a bracha, you're taking that physical thing and you're bringing it into the next world. And a marriage, it's the same thing. If it's just based on, on a physical, it's not going to go to the next world. But a marriage that's, that's based on a spiritual connection, right, and an emotional connection, so that connection is, <coughs> is in the next world. And there's many stories that Rav Chaim Vital brings down, that Rav Chaim Vital brings down from that. So what, what Mishpatim is telling us over here is that if this is in front of you all the time, your whole life is different. So she took my parking space. After 120, I'm not going to get a parking space. I'm not going to get a party because you're going to put me in this little thing and that's it. It's not important. And things become much less important when you realize that you can't take them with you. My father was very, my father was Shalom, was very, very, much, very, very much like that. Now, I once gave a shear like this and um, I got a lot of flack. 
I don't, I don't even know if there were emails in those days, but I got a lot of phone calls that how could you give a share against materialism and that it's not important? You get dressed well, you drive a fancy car, you have a big house, you eat in restaurants. So at Walston, you're giving a whole share that's not important and you can't take it with you. So why are you like that? Well, the bottom of my shoes are not red, first of all. They don't have to look. <laughs> so this is what I want to say about my father. There's a difference between liking and wanting to have good things and pretty things and nice things and needing to have nice things and pretty things and a beautiful car and a beautiful house. If you can afford it, the Torah says, give my sir. The most you can give is a fifth. That's it. The rest is yours. The Torah doesn't tell you give away everything that you have. If you give away more than a fifth, then you mevazvez bit tzedakah and you'll lose all your money. You're not supposed to give more than a 20, actually a twentieth of your money. So if you have the means and you're not stealing from anybody, you have a right to have nice things. But if you need those things, then you're in the wrong place. So if you have a nice car, but someone banks into it and you don't flip out, right? And you don't really keep it that so great and so nice. Or if you have a nice house and something breaks and you don't flip out and everybody has to take off their shoes before they walk into your house because they're scared you're going to get something, right? So I was brought up that if you can have nice things, it's fine. But if someone takes those nice things away or someone breaks those nice things, who cares? I want to tell you a story about my father, Roshan. The really... It really made a, such an impact in my way, and I don't think I ever said this story, an impact in my way of doing, of, of chinuch. So when I first started teaching 34 years ago, I answered an ad about a school that was in the Bronx. I had no experience. I had no resume. Um, I never taught a day in my life. Only thing I would have been able to put on my resume was I got kicked out of yeshiva in third grade. Um, I don't think that would have helped. So I answered this ad in the Jewish press. There's a school in the Bronx looking for a sixth grade Rebbe. I lived in Brooklyn. It's a 40 minute ride. But I made up with my father that I'm going to be a Rebbe half a day. I'm going to be business half a day. A word is a word. The word I can't in my family didn't exist. My father was an American soldier. I can't. They blew out of their heads. There was no... They, not that you weren't allowed to say the word I can't. The word I can't didn't exist. After training, you, you, there was, you didn't think, there was, there was no such thing as thinking I can't. It didn't, they wiped it out of your head. There's no such thing. Jump off the cliff. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Right off. They were trained that way. He said, you don't understand. He was a Jewish boy, a thin, skinny Jewish Yankee, right, who was drafted into the army in the Korean War, my father. And they sent him down to maneuvers in Savannah, Georgia, with all the rednecks, right, anti-Jew, anti-Yankees. They were still in the Civil War in their heads. They didn't like us. And in, in walks a skinny Jewish, I don't want to use the word that they use, right? And, and how is he, you know, how is he going to survive in, in such a, he said, so, so they, had, they used to have bayonets. These are these knives that were on the, on the, at the top of the gun. And in World War II and in the Korean War, so when they had hand-to-hand -hand battle, you'd have to take the gun with the bayonet, stick it into the guy's guts, turn it around, and pull his whole insides out. My father's like, he's a Jewish boy from New York, right? He's like, no. Like, no way I could ever do that. Take a, a, a thing, and turn, you have to turn it and flip the guy's gut? No, no. He said, Zechariah, by the time I was four weeks in training, they had these, like, figures. He said, we would go in there, charge them, one motion, Pull the whole thing out. He said, you were trained the word I can't didn't exist. It was, yes, sir. In my house, the word I can't didn't exist. Maybe that's why Arnava's still here. Maybe that's why Arnava exists. Because people said, it won't work. You can't have these women, that women from, not from, uh, different ages, all that won't work. And there's no such thing as won't or I can't. There's no such thing as I don't want to, then you get a whack. But there's no such thing as I can't. So... I went to the Bronx, and 
the kids in the Bronx were living in tenements. You know what a tenement is? Tenement is an apartment building that has no heat and no windows. <coughs> and these Jewish kids were the last kids left, like, in the Bronx. They had, these were the poorest people that existed. And here I am. This is who I'm teaching. So I walk into school, teaching in sixth grade. I never taught a day in my life. I sit down and... I gave him some donuts and some potato chips. That worked right away because these kids, half of them weren't eating. And, and we were doing pretty good for my first week in yeshiva. I was enjoying it. It was a long ride back, an FDR drive back and forth. And then one day, the principal walks in, the rabbi, and he takes this little skinny kid in my class. He says, why did you do something like that? And he just smacks him one. Now, this was already no smacking days. This is not when I was growing up. This was 34 years ago. You didn't smack kids. I was like, excuse me? This is my class, you just, you, rabbi, you just walked in like, you didn't, you didn't like, you didn't even knock, right? I'm like, I quit. He said, no, 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 we like you, the kids like you. No, no, I'm like, I'm not in Shinnach to beat up kids, that's what happened to me in third grade. Uh, 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 that ain't happening. He says, no, no, if you stay, you stay, I will, I'm not going to hit any more kids. Okay? All the kids were like, stay. <laughs> okay? Two weeks later in the lunchroom, whack! Smacked another kid. I'm like, I'm out of here. Let me tell you what happened in between those four weeks. Or two, three weeks, whatever it was. So the first week I was there, I see how poor these kids are. They were mamish. Their, 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 their clothing was ripped. It was freezing. They were mamish in the tenements. They were, they were welfare cases. It was like terrible. I said, you know what? I was just married. I was a few weeks into my marriage. I was like, I called up my parents. I'm like, I have these kids, their mamas have no food. Would you mind if me and if we bring them, if I bring like five or six kids to Muncie for Shabbos? So my parents loved kids at the table. My father always loved kids at the table. So he said, sure, bring them. He was very proud that I was a Rebbe. So I piled these six guys in and we go to Muncie, me, my wife, and, and these six boys. And we have this amazing Shabbos. But the funny thing is that during the meal, first of all, they're, they're eating everything, everything. And that during the meal, one by one, they keep going to the bathroom. And I'm thinking, you know, I don't know. Maybe there's a sickness in the tenements. I don't know. But mom is like, every few minutes, they go into the bathroom. Like, Can I go to the bathroom? Can I go to the bathroom? Yeah, go, 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 go. Like, okay. So it comes once to Shabbos. It comes once to Shabbos. And in Muncie, we had hub bowling. Remember, hub bowling on Route 59. And I'm like, Tati, I'm going to take them bowling. Sunday morning, we're going to go play football. I'm going to bring them back Sunday afternoon. They were so happy and they were so thankful. And I'm going to take them bowling and we're going to go for pizza. I was very excited. <laughs> so I took them bowling. I don't think any of them ever went bowling. You don't know what, the mamas were like, wow. You throw the ball down and then it disappears. And 10 seconds later, it comes back up. I'm like, no, that's not the object of the game, guys. <laughs> the object of the game is to hit those white things in the middle. Oh, we, th- we thought you were supposed to get it on the side that you shouldn't hit it. I'm like, no, no. Okay. Then they took the ball. I remember it was funny because would you remember the 34? They have these things when they clean the ball. That's like it's a machine. They were busy with that. I'm like, no, no, we're here to bowl. They were like, no, so it shines. And I'm like, anyway, they were, they were never, they were kids. So what's going on in my house at this time? My mother, my parents are yekas. So my mother goes downstairs where the kids are sleeping. All their underwear, they're guys, you know. All their underwear, socks, everything is strewn all over the place. So my mother wants to be nice and put it back in, back in the suitcases. So she opens the suitcases. And in the suitcase is all her jewelry. It's an Emma Sticker story. All my mother's jewelry. And in the next suitcase is half the silverware. And silver cups. And stuff from, the, from Pesach. They stole everything. Oh. What was happening was, they were leaving the table, they went into my mother's room, didn't go to the bathroom, went through her drawers, took her stuff, went downstairs, and the next guy did it. They ripped us off totally. All my mother's jewelry. Oh, well, she didn't have that much jewelry, but all the jewelry, and a lot of silver. So she calls my father, and I, I don't know about this. I'm bowling, pizza, life's great. Are these great kids, like, you know? You gotta take them out, you know? Beautiful. So my mother goes running to my father. You can imagine. She can't breathe. She's like, you have to come downstairs. You have to see what's going on. My father runs downstairs. She goes, look, they stole everything. My father, you should sit in Ganadin next, next to the Kisar cover. Tells my mother, 
take everything out, go through all their luggage, take all the silver cups, all your rings, everything, take everything out, there was some cash, take everything out, put it back in our room, put it back in the thing, lock it, don't say one word to them. Father said, they're going to come back, they're going to open their suitcase, they're going to see all the stuff's gone, they're going to know that we know. We don't have to embarrass them. Hear the godless? I would have been ripping heads. You crazy? <laughs> I told you when they took my donut what happened, right? My cupcake. You come into my house, I invite you for Shabbos, you steal my wife's jewelry and my cups, put you in the car now, and I'm taking you home and I won't ever see you again. Kofi, tell you to come to my house? I would have gone nuts. And I was their Rebbe. My father said, don't you say, don't you dare embarrass these kids. They will be embarrassed enough, they're going to open that suitcase, and it's all gone, they're going to know that we know. So, I bring them back. I guess that I never said a word. I didn't know about the whole story. My mother calls me upstairs to my parents' bedroom, and they tell me the whole story. And I was like, Dad, I would have ripped their heads off. My father's like, they're poor. They have nothing. Why do you think they stole? I think they stole because they're kleptomaniacs. They have nothing. They have nothing. They see jewelry. They see silver. They never sold the stuff in the land. He said, they, it's a nebuch on them, and now they're so embarrassed because they know that we caught them. What do we gain by, by yelling at them and embarrassing them? We gain nothing. Did not say a word. Godless? Is that godless? That's godless. Tuesday or Wednesday, I get a phone call from my father. Listen, me and mommy thought about it. Invite him again. <laughs> I said, do we have like a big insurance policy? <laughs> I, said, I said, what do you mean? He said, he said, they must be so hungry. Don't worry. We took all the jewelry, put it in the safe, and I'll make sure all the silver is locked. There'll be nothing for them to take. Invite them again. Mm. So, I invited them again for Shabbos. <laughs> they didn't come. Because they were embarrassed. The third week because it must have been four weeks the third week they did two or three of them did come so to, to, to understand in other words you can have beautiful silver cups and you can have beautiful jewelry but if someone takes it right if to realize that it's not the most important thing in the world I'm not going to make myself crazy about it I'm not even going to embarrass the kid who took it because it's not that important. They don't bury you with any jewelry, by the way. They take all your earrings out, all your necklaces, everything. Nothing. You leave, begapa yavai, begapa yetze. That's it. They don't even bury you in glasses. Even if you say you can't see the next world unless you have your glasses, they don't care. <laughs> nothing. You leave with nothing. So, I'm not telling everyone in this room that you're not allowed to have nice things. You're allowed to have nice things. Hashem wants you to have nice things. And he wants a Jewish girl to dress nicely. And he wants you to have a nice house. And he wants you to have nice things. At the same time, he wants you to realize, Elam Meshpashim at Tisassim of Nehem. But in the end, it's Begat Ba Yetzay. You don't need nice things. It's nice to have nice things. And if for some reason you don't have nice things, or you lost nice things, or something happens to those nice things, remember in the end, you don't have them anyway. And that's the Kabbalistic behind the Pasha. And then it talks about the next Psukim where he changes and he says that, well, on this shot it stays the same, where, where if the person says, I want it forever, um, I love my children and I love my parents and I love all this, so so that's a person... It's a little, little bit of a different shot that I heard. So if you look at the Pasuk, it says, Ahafti es adaini, es ishti bez banai, lo yeitze chavshi, right? That, that I love, I love all, everything that I have, so you don't, you don't go out free. The only problem with this shot is why does he get punished that he, has, that he gets a marzea? The reason this ever gets punished is because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, He's saying, I, I am willingly want to be the servant of a person. And we heard, we heard on Harsinai that the only one that you're a servant to is Hashem. 
So therefore, the first six years, you had no choice. You owe the guy money. You had to work, right? But now why are you staying? You're staying because it's great. I get the pillow. They have to give me the food first. I don't have to, I don't have to depend on God at all. Because my master, my Jewish master, he's giving me everything. So I don't have to depend on Hashem at all. But it says, Anoich Hashem alikecha. The person has to depend on Hashem. So we make a hole in his ear, in his earlobe. Make a hole in his earlobe because you heard with your ear that Sarah said, and now you're becoming a slave on your own. You have to be punished. But there's another pshat. And the other pshat is a hard one to understand. It says, because you heard in the Ten Commandments you're not allowed to steal, and the reason you were sold as an Ebed Ivri is because you stole. So that's why we make a hole in your ear. Does that make sense to anyone here? It's a very big question on that. Again, you were at Har Sinai. You heard you're not allowed to steal. You went ahead and you stole. So now we're going to make a hole in your ear because you didn't listen to what you were supposed to listen to. What's the problem with that shot? It's a big problem with that shot. The problem is that you should make a hole in his ear after six years. The reason he got sold was because he stole. So he got sold for six years. So make the hole then. You didn't listen. You stole. Why only if he says, I love my master. I, love, I want to stay here. That's when you make the hole. If the reason is because he stole, then you should make the hole after the first six years. Why now? And the answer is because he didn't do tshuva. Because you did something wrong. You stole. You did your punishment. You worked for six years. So you accepted I did something wrong and I did my punishment. Now you're saying, no. I want to stay <coughs> till 50 years are up. So what are you saying? You're saying that those six years wasn't a punishment. Who would say, I want another 44 years of punishment? No one's going to say, I want another 44 years of punishment. So by saying that you want to stay till the 50th year, what you're saying is that the first six years wasn't a punishment. The first six years wasn't a punishment? You heard you weren't allowed to steal? So you didn't get a punishment? So now you're going to get punished. Now we're going to make a hole in your earlobe. That's why it only happens after, after he says that. So I heard a story in my travels. We'll end with this story. No, you take a story. It sounds like a Kalabach story, but it's not a Kalabach story. I might start singing Kalabach in the middle, but it's not a Kalabach story. It's a true story. It didn't happen with the Masha. It happened with another big gadol. I forgot the name of the gadol. It'll come to me in the middle of the story. Anyway, there was a guy in the town, and he was called Yankel the Schlepper. It's a true story. And what he did for a living was he schlepped for people heavy things. That's what he did. Yankel the schlepper. And they paid him very little. He schlepped from one side of the town, a bed, you're moving. They paid him pennies. And every Friday, he would go to this bar and he would take all his pennies and he would buy a bottle of vodka. And it was very cold. It was in Russia. And he would drink this bottle of vodka, Erev Shabbos. And he would get stark drunk, like totally drunk, blitzed out of his head. And every Friday night, he would come, come into shul, drunk. And he would sing, Manishtana, in the middle of Chododi, Shoshanis Yaakov. And the kids used to love it when he would come walking into shul, right? They'd all follow. We had like 100 kids behind him. And then everybody's singing, right? And he's, and he's singing, and all the kids would have this big laugh. And, and then Yanka would sleep in the shul that night. And this would happen every Friday night. And the only reason Yanka worked, the only reason he worked, was that he would get that bottle of vodka. And he used to count in his pocket. The more pennies he had, the bigger bottle of vodka he got. 
So he used to work Sunday and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, and he would work and he would say, Ive, I have no business, but I have eight cents. Now I have nine cents. Now I have ten cents. And he would be like my story of the wine. He would be like dreaming. It's coming Friday. It's Tuesday. It's Wednesday. I'm a day away. I'm two days away. Oh, I can't wait. I tasted it already. I'm thirsty. Right? He was mamasha drunk. He was an alcoholic. He was mamasha an alcoholic. And everybody in the town knew this. went on for 15 years. Everybody knew Yanko the Schlepper. Everybody knew him. No ridiculous story. One day, so he had a very bad week. And he was working very, very hard, and he just wasn't making a lot of money. And it was Tuesday, and it was Wednesday, and he was davening to Hashem. Hashem, the only thing I have in my life is Erev Shabbos, is my bottle of, my bottle of vodka. It's already Thursday, and I don't have enough money to buy a bottle. Help me. Mamish, like, like Hashem from, came down from Shemayim. As he's talking, right, a guy walks by with a wagon full of stuff, and he says, hey, Schlepper, I need to unload my wagon really fast. Would you help, will you help me? And he made all the money that he needed. So, Friday morning, he goes out, makes a couple of more pennies, and he's on his way, there of Shabbos, to the bar. And as he's walking to the bar, this is a true story. As he's walking to the Ritva, the Riva, as he's walking to the bar, he hears a woman crying. And he turns to hear where she's crying from, and he sees this little hut. And he walks over to the hut, and he knows who this woman is. She's a very, very poor woman. But every Erev Shabbos, he used to bring her food. And it's Erev Shabbos, almost Shabbos, and no one brought her food. So he walks in, and she's crying, and he says, how can I help you? She says, Yankel, I have seven kids. We have no food for Shabbos, it's the first time. I have no food for Shabbos. Nobody brought me food this week. I don't have a dime to my name. I have nothing. He says, what can I do for you? I'm just as poor as you are. She says, Yankel, maybe give up the money for the vodka this week and buy me food. He's like, listen, there's so many rich people in this town. Why do you need money from me? There are rich people in this town. She goes, it's almost Shabbos. I can't, I'm not, I'm not, I can't. I can't go out. I'm old, I'm sick. I can't. Come on, give me your money. He says, you don't understand. I even daven to Hashem this week. I, this is my whole life. I, I can't go through Shabbos not drunk. I'm not going to make it. And he walks out. And he goes to the bar. And he sits down. And he takes out his money in his hand. And he counts 19 kapeks, whatever they call them. It's one of the biggest bottles that he's had in a long time. Because he had that unbelievable Thursday. And he says to the bartender, I got 19. What do I get? And he, big bottle. Puts down on the table. And Yanko's like, I can't do this. And all the drunks out that are sitting there at the bar are like, what do you mean you can't do this? He goes, there's a woman who's starving and her kids for Shabbos. But Yanko, you, you, you got a drink. I know, I know, but... And he turns around with that bottle in front of him. And he pushes it back to the bartender. He says, I can't take it. Turns around, goes back to the woman's house. He says, here's the money. One of the stores was still open. They ran. They got food for Shabbos, whatever it was. He's coming into Shabbos sober for the first time. 25 years, 15 years, 20, long, long, long time. And no one knows. The kids are all waiting in shul. Yaakov the drunk is going to come in by L'chadaydi and sing Manishtana. Shoshana is Yaakov. And everybody's waiting in shul. The guy, I heard the story. The guy, the guy's a better storyteller than me. I was sitting there like, wow. And everybody's in shul. The kids are waiting by the door for Yaakov to walk in. L'chadaydi, Yaakov walks in. He walks into the door. And everybody, everybody in the shul sees he's, he's, epic, he's different than different than every week. 
And they sing Lecha Daidi and he begins to sing. Lecha Daidi. And he starts to sing with them and all the kids are like, what happened to him? He's sober. This is the true story. At the end of Lecha Daidi, he dies. He's a heart attack and he dies on the spot. On the spot. After Shabbos, Chavar Kadisha takes him, they bury him. I don't know, it wasn't the ritual, I can't remember the name. It was the Rajba, maybe. One of the biggest, big, big dailim from the, from the Dairi, Dairi, Dairi. <coughs> Lived in the next town. Lived in the next town. So they buried Yankel. His last Shabbos, he sang with Chodaydi. So this Rav is sitting in his room. And he's learning. And all of a sudden, Yankel... The schlepper walks in, and the Rav says to him, Yankel, what are you doing? You have to stop drinking. What did you, you walked all the way from your town in the cold to my town. What, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? He says, I'm here to call you to Bezdin Shomayla, to the court in Shemayim. He says, Lachem, are you drinking? You're calling me to the Bezdin Shalmayla. He's blitz, he thinks he's blitzed out of his head. Coming to talk to the Rav, right? The Rosh Hashiva. You're coming to call me to the Bezdin Shalmayla. She says, Yankel, it's been so long. You have to come back. You have to stop drinking. Now get out of here. And Yankel turns around and he walks out. The Rav continues learning. And he says, hold on a second. How do you get into my house? My doors are locked. So he runs to the front door. Door's locked. So I look at his windows. Locked. They're, they're locked from inside. How do you get into my house? How do you get into my room? I didn't even hear the door in my room where I was learning open and close. And he's like getting chills like there's something very wrong. So he puts on his coat and he runs to the yeshiva. And the yeshiva walks in the middle of the night as some boys learning. He says to them, did you see Yankel the schlepper? He was just in my house. I'm sure he can't walk back now in the middle of the night. Is he in yeshiva? Is he laying on a bench? They say, what, yeshiva, what are you talking about? He passed away on Shabbos. So what are you, what are you talking about? He was, in my, he was just in my room. He says, no, he passed away on Shabbos. Hallelujah. He passed away on Shabbos. What are you talking about? He says, Rebbe, he passed away on Shabbos. He runs back to his room. He runs back to his house. He sits down. He's like, I'm not crazy. He was in my room. So he says, Yanko, if you hear me, and they want to see me in Bezen Shalmayla, I just found out that you're in Mila. If you would come back, I'd like to know what's going on. Two seconds later, he's back in the room. He says to him, why are they calling me to Bezal Shalmaila? He says, because there are a lot of poor people in this town. And you collect money for tzedakah only from the rich. And if you knew the power of tzedakah in the next world, you'd understand that you have to give the poor people a chance to even give a penny or a little bit. You never ask the poor people for money. So the Rav said, but I would never ask the poor people. They don't have money. Why would I take money from them? He says, because even a per poor person needs to have on the next world schosim. And therefore, the Bezim Shamayla wants you to know that from now on, when you collect tzedakah, you have to go to the poor people too. So he says to Yankel, he says, I don't understand. Bezim Shamayla is sending you as a shliach between that world and this world? The first year a person dies is very, is din. You're not even supposed to pray by the, like, you're not, they don't make you into their shliach. Like, what did you do? You never learned, you were always drunk. What did you do? So he told them. He said, I broke my addiction to save someone else. He told them the story how he saved this woman's life and her children. He said, I broke who I was to save this woman. And therefore in Shemayim they gave me a job. 
<laughs> and until it's time for me to be in my right place in Gan Eden, my job is to travel with Elia Navi between that world and this world. What that is? So, that's what Mishpatim is talking about. Begapa Yavah, Begapa Yetzeh. You come in alone, you go out alone. The question is, what do you do between the two points? If you can break your teva, if you can break your addiction, so to say, if you can break your teva to help somebody else, look at what, how they look at it in the next world. You can't be an Evet Ivri. You can't become an Evet. You can only be an Evet HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You can't become a slave. A slave is another word for an addiction. A slave to your addiction. You can't become a slave to your phone. How many of us, are we the slave of the phone? Or is the phone the slave of us? You should have seen in my plane this morning when it landed. You should have seen when that stewardess said, you may now turn on all your electronic devices. It was Mashiach came. <laughs> there were people that were sitting there. there was, it was an all-night flight, right? Uh, the minute they said you could turn on your leg, wow, the whole place, mom, lit up. They had those phones and they make anything bigger. Lit up. It was like, I'm telling you, like Mashiach came. The, the wheels touched. It was like, it's like, I was like, I can wait five minutes. We just landed. Like, who's looking for me? It's early in the morning, right? I can wait five minutes. Mamish slaves, they were, they were opening their phones. They weren't even up yet. And they were opening their phones. So the, the question is, who's, who's the, are we the slave or to our phones or the phones? And that's what a person needs to know. That's what the whole Pasha, if you look through the whole Pasha of Mishpatim, but it has to be Tassim Lefnan. It has to be in front of you all the time. You have to, you have to think about it. And if kids come into your house, and they steal your diamond ring and you catch them, you have to be, it has to mean so little to you that you'll invite them again. That's godless. That you'll invite them again, the same person who stole from you. You're going to make sure you're not stupid. You're not going to leave it out, but you're going to make sure. Because that goes with a person. And that, I'm telling you from experience, you will not get angry at people. You will not be greedy. You will be much more relaxed if you realize at the end of the day we all go up to Shemayim the same. And the only question is what my Simtraven did we do? What good deeds did we, did we do? And that's what a person is in this world. And a woman has an extra thing to do. Because she's Shosani Kritsono. And I think it's very, very important after spending the three weeks that I did and I probably spoke, oh my gosh, between London, 24 times. I probably spoke in the last three weeks, 70 times. Times an hour and a half, you figure it out. It's like 100 hours. I didn't even know what, at the last speech, I didn't even know what I was talking about. I was talking about pizza. They, 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 well, how does pizza have anything to do with this passion? And they're like, I'm like, I don't know either. I want to go home. I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired. But I want you to know something. I spoke to men, and I spoke to women. And I have to tell you this. I don't want to put something on your shoulders, but at the end of the day, the end of the day, the bringing up of the children, the setting up of the house, it's you. It's yours. It's you. At the end of the day, the guy is not home. He tries to mess up everything that you try to do, but he can't really mess it all up. And this disease, I know I talk a lot about it, but it's this disease of the phone and the, and the internet and the Facebook. It's aimed at you. It's aimed at you more than at me. Because if you don't give time to your kids, if, if a father gives no time to his children, but the mother gives all her time to the children, you're going to have healthy children. It's better, the father gives also, trust me. But if the father doesn't give time, he's not home. He's learning, he's working. But you're home. You're home with the most precious people in the world, your kids. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm dealing with a lot of dysfunction. I'm dealing with a lot of stuff. The end of the day, if the mother, uh, you know, you're like, oh, you're a man. That's why you're saying it. The father, when he's home, has to give his kids attention. But he's not, he doesn't, he doesn't have that much time at home. 
you have much more time. When a child's young, right, you're home with that child. You gotta give that kid time. Ornava, we're starting, we're starting Ornava at sixth grade. Girls, there's a reason. There's a reason that we need to have gals, this whole thing, for sixth graders and seventh graders and eighth graders and ninth graders. Because if people would give their kids the time that they need, we wouldn't have to give them any time. Because your kids would ask you, Mommy, how do you know there's a Hashem? And who was here before Hashem? And who's Hashem's Tati? And how do you know that Yiddishkeit is correct? But if you're always on the phone with Chayola and Sarola and Mirola and this friend and that friend and this and arranging, we're going out to eat lunch, we're going out to do this, we're going to... So, so of course the kid's not going to ask you. The kid's going to ask me. Why is your kid asking me? That's already not good. If your kid's asking me questions, that's already not a good sign. I'm begging you. I'm begging you. Yetzel Lachavshi. And I'm begging every woman that's watching this. For your children's sake, for your sake... The phone is a necessity to call the people that you need to call. But don't become a servant to it. And Facebook, I talk about it a lot. It's not Facebook. It's not Facebook. It's the whole screen. It's the whole internet. It's the whole DVD. At the end of the day, you can watch 100,000 hours of movies. They're going to put you into the ground. The movies will not go with you. Zero. Your brain, right? It takes three days and the maggots have it. It's gone. There's nothing there. All that brain stuff that you had in your brain is gone. So all those DVDs tonight when you go home, you want to watch that DVD and you want to waste two and a half hours of your life, just remember, it's not going anywhere with you. It's gone. It's zero. It's ear. It's bluff. It's the satan. It's the Yetzirah. He takes bluff and he makes it real. It's nothing. If you're not married and you don't have kids, spend the time with yourself. So you're healthy. Spend the time with yourself. Read. Learn. Do something good. That you'll keep. Torah is an interesting thing because Torah, Hashem, Hashem had to make Torah a mitzvah. You know why? Why isn't it just knowledge? Let's open a Chumash, right? And let's just all read the Chumash, Gemara and everything else for knowledge. You know why? Because if it was knowledge then it stays in this world. It doesn't go with you. It stays with your brain, which rots in the grave, and it's gone. It's like biology. So what does Hashem do? Because He loves us. He took this, and He made it a mitzvah. So now when you read a book tonight, a Muslim book, a Sefer book, I don't care, God, whatever you want to read, right? That has to do with Judaism, whatever it is. So when your brain is with the maggots, what you learned is with you in the next world. So Hashem took the Torah... And it would have just been, he would have given us, here, I want you all to be brilliant. Study. It's a subject. Every word of Torah is a mitzvah. Because it has to be. Otherwise, you're not, you're not going to leave this world with it. So Hashem took every thought, every, every compliment you call someone, you call your grandmother, you say, hi, Bobby, how are you feeling? Wow. It's a mitzvah. Those words go with you to the next world. We're out of our minds. We're nuts. All of us, me included. We're crazy. We're in this world for 70 years, 80 years, 90. We're going out with nothing. And the only stuff that we're going out with is our Torah and our mitzvahs and our mice and toivim. And we're busy with these metal machines. We're nuts. We're in a treasury of billions of dollars and we're picking up pretzels. And, and I see it wherever I go. I see it in my shiurim. That every five seconds, they're, they're looking at it. They're looking at it. I see it in seminary. I see it in all the places that I went to speak. I'm not telling you guys. The guys are worse. <laughs> guys are worse, but they're not home. They're not home. You're home. You're, you're created. You know, I'm not a... I'm going to get it from all the feminists now, but... but you can stand on your head and, 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 and argue the point. But God created you physically different than men. There's a reason for that. And that is because you have children and you nurse children and you, you're, you're protectors and you're creators and you're nurturers and you can stand up and you can be a feminist and you can say, we're equal to men. You're not equal to men. You were never equal to men. You're a lot better than men. Why do you want to be equal to men? That's dropping. 
We don't nurture. We don't protect. We don't feed our young. Try to get a guy to even give a bottle to a kid. No burp already. Come on, has the air in it. Come on. Right? We're like, Shh, drink it, drink it, drink it. We, we don't, this is not who we are. We're not nurturers. We're not feeders. We're not protectors. We, we're running to the giant football game, to, to the hockey game. We, we, we can't sit still. So you're the ones. Sorry. That's your responsibility. You're way above us. You the Icarus Habayas. Oh, good only Icarus Habayas. I sound like my Mora. That's what you are. You are the Icarus Habayas. And I'm telling you, I spent three weeks and I, and I was all over the world. And it's a disease. It's a disease. Girls, to the point where they're Mechal Shabbos. We're on their phones on Shabbos. You're sick. That's sick. They won't turn a light on on Shabbos. They only eat Chal of Yisrael. They're tzias to their ankles. And they're texting on Shabbos. And I'm looking at this girl, I'm like, what is wrong in this picture? Would you turn on a light? You crazy, Rebel Wallstein? Turn on lights? Kaylee Shaney, Kaylee Shlishi. Kaylee Shlishi. I'm like, what's your phone? Kaylee Weishi or Kaylee Shaney? What, what is it? I'm so sick. It's such an addiction. It's momish an addiction. You got to break it. You got to break it. For yourself, for me. Not for me, for yourself. If you have time, spend it with yourself. Spend it with the safer. You'll thank me after 120. I promise you, every girl that went on Facebook, every single one of them that sent me a, a, a message, they went on Facebook, they're thanking me now, forget it. After 120, that's when you'll thank me. Seven hours, five hours, 12 hours, 15 hours, 40 hours a week, 60 hours, doing nothing in a world that doesn't exist. The Satan laughs, he laughs at all of you. You're the biggest joke. We're the biggest joke in the whole freaking world. He looks at a whole world of human beings talking to each other with digits. You idiots! God created you with a mouth to talk. The difference between an animal and a human is that we're able to talk. We don't talk. We text. We use our fingers. Satan's sitting there laughing his brains out. Look what I created. Look at these fools. Look! They're watching a movie. Look at those two girls. They're crying. Pass me the Kleenex. She died from cancer. I can't believe it. Let's play it again. See us amazing. They watched the movie a second time. See us amazing. I told my rabbi, Rabbi Gamal doesn't understand. I'm like, I, sh I know there's going to be see us amazing. People that watch a movie, she dies, right? And they're like, you think you want to watch it again? It was a good crier. And they watch it again. She's back alive in the beginning of the movie. See us amazing. To write the Tchisa Mason. So now, how, how do you think it looks in Shemayim? There you are, you're sitting, someone died from cancer, and she was in love with this guy, and the suffering, and the women, and the, oh, it was such a good movie. It was such a good cry. What? It's fake. It's bluff. It has an on and off button. You want to cry? Go to Slow Memorial. Go do Chesed with little kids that have cancer. They're real. You can feel them. You can give them a toy. You can give them a Danish. It'll give you a smile. All the actresses, Demi Moore and all these people, these are not, these are not real people. One day they're this, the next day they're this. The next day they're not alive anymore. Big superstars. It's a fake world. It's not a real world. What a lesson this week's Pasha. Ve'ela ha'mishpatim. Mishpat is something that we understand. Chayk is something we don't understand. Because Baruch Hu says, Eilah HaMishpatim, this is easy to understand. This is, you don't have to be so deep. Because a person knows that when they die, they take nothing with them. So Eilah HaMishpatim, Asher Tassim Lefneim, this is simple. Put it in front of you all the time. Begapa Yavri, Begapa Yetzi, your whole life is different. You'll turn your phone off. It won't mean that much anymore. The movie won't mean that much anymore. You're going to watch and say, what am I doing? This is fake. Let me go... Let me go, oh my gosh, look at this. Let me go do Shalom Bayis if you're a married woman. Let me, let me, go, let me go help the real thing. Why am I crying at something fake? I'm reading a book.